Um, so there are heaps of things that can trigger laminitis, um, but there's two main feed-related ones. So the first one is the fermentation of large amounts of starch and sugar in the hindgut. So if you, um, the scientific way of inducing laminitis, um, and they still do it, is they get a corn slurry, so ground up corn, and they stick a nasogastric tube down and they give a horse a massive amount of corn slurry, and you'll have laminitis in 20-something hours. Um, like crippling laminitis in 20-something hours. So um, it just basically feeds the starch-fermenting bacteria in the hindgut a huge amount of starch, which they ferment, um, and you get you get really, really severe acidosis. And the acidosis gets so bad, if you watch, they've, they've tracked bacterial populations in the hindgut when they do this to horses, give them a, <clears throat> a lot of corn, and you'll see um, the fibre-fermenting ones will be there, and then they all die and they disappear, and you get a certain family of, of starch fermenting ones, and then they actually die and disappear because it gets too acidic for them. And then the lactobacillus bacteria all take over and just produce massive amounts of lactic acid. But if there's enough starch there, they actually produce so much acid that they kill themselves too, and then there's no bacteria in the hindgut left. Um, so it's pretty dramatic when it when it happens, and it's a very, very reliable way to um, cause laminitis. And this is the type of laminitis you'll see when... Um, I just my sister-in-law, um, my well, I suppose my sister-in-law's mum, so my brother's in-law, mother-in-law. Um, her favourite horse, which was in a paddock on their farm, they had a farmer that just harvested barley, and they had a farmer that just dumped a whole bunch of barley on the ground, and either didn't realise the horses were in the paddock or didn't realise that it would hurt the horses. Um, so poor old Yellow Hooey went up and had a big gut full of barley and had just crippling laminitis. Um, and they, they almost got her back to being okay, but then um, about six weeks after that had happened, she had relapse and they, they couldn't do anything for her. So this is, this is the kind of laminitis you'll see when someone <coughs> breaks into the feed shed or someone gets um, a heap of grain that they shouldn't get. Um, so the process is you get the, the fermentation, you get hindgut acidosis, you get the death of the fibre-fermenting bacteria in the hindgut. The gut wall starts to leak, so stuff that shouldn't get out of the gut gets out. Um, and something comes out. They still don't even know what it is. They think it's something from um, the bacteria that are actually dead. Um, but something comes out of the gut into the bloodstream and it goes to the hoof and you get all these changes in, in the hoof um, and how it how it actually moves, so how the hoof wall moves past the um, pedal bone, and literally the whole structure just falls apart, um, and the lamina just don't hang on to the hoof wall. So the lamina, um, you've got the, the hoof, the pedal bone inside, and then you've got your hoof wall on the outside, and the, the lamina are the attachment between the hoof wall and the pedal bone. And in a healthy horse, if you try and rip the lamina apart, it'll just tear because you just physically can't separate it. It's such a strong structure. In a laminitic horse, when you pull it, it just opens up like a zipper. Um, so there's just no, it just can't hold the um, pedal bone up inside the hoof anymore. It just falls, falls down. Um, the other way that it can happen is you get the consumption of a high non-structural carbohydrate diet in an insulin-resistant horse. So have you all heard about insulin resistance in horses, generally in fat ponies? So insulin is a hormone that is released by um, the horse's pancreas and our pancreas as well. It does exactly the same things in a human as it does in a horse. But um, when we eat, so you've all just eaten something that had starch in it, so the little pastries and the bread and things like that. So at, at this very moment, you've got a whole lot of glucose floating around in your bloodstream because your little starch-suggesting enzymes have chopped up the starch in the food that you've just eaten, and your small intestine has absorbed that into your blood, and now you've got a whole heap of glucose, which is good because glucose is the only fuel that your brain cells can burn and the only fuel that your red blood cells can burn, but it's actually quite toxic to have a lot of glucose floating around in your blood, so your body needs to store it out of the blood and then access it when it needs it. And the, the trigger or the signal for storing glucose is insulin. So your pancreas will go, huh, a little bit too much glucose in the bloodstream and it will release insulin. And insulin just goes around and basically knocks on the, on the door of the muscle cells in the body and goes, too much glucose floating around in the blood, guys, can you please suck some in? And there's these little transporters called GLUT4 transporters that will move from inside a muscle cell and go up and attach to the outside of the muscle cell. So they're still inside, but they make an opening to the outside and they'll just suck glucose in. Um, and then an insulin will keep floating around and giving them the signal to suck the glucose in until the glucose levels go back to right where the body would like it. And then insulin disappears and your glucose levels are, are beautiful and stable again. Um, and 
and it all works really nicely. In an insulin resistant horse, what happens is the insulin's going, knocking on the door of the muscle cells going, too much glucose out here, you need to suck some in. And it's like the muscle cells are deaf. They don't hear the message from the insulin and so they don't move their little GLUT4 transporters out to suck the glucose in. <laughs> but the pancreas doesn't know that that's what's going on and the pancreas just pick, keep, keeps picking up the fact that there's too much glucose in the body and it keeps releasing insulin. So it releases more and more insulin and, and you get in an insulin resistant horse, what you'll see is these huge amounts of insulin um, to control glucose levels. So they can keep their glucose levels under control but it takes a massive amount of insulin and that, that's the condition called insulin resistance. So horses that are um, insulin resistant, what happens is you get the enzymatic digestion of starch in the small intestine or sugars um, and then that's absorbed in the small intestine as glucose and then you get this excessive release of insulin so there's massively high levels of in insulin from the pancreas which then travel around and end up in the hoof and damage the lamellae and they still don't really know. Um, I had a coffee with um, Simon Bailey on, what was oh, it? was only yesterday. <laughs> I was going to say a few days ago. It was only yesterday. Um, and he's He's done a heap of research, um, and Sam Potter, who's sitting up the back, who works with us at FedExL, um, has worked with Simon on a lot of this research as well, um, looking at how insulin actually causes the damage in the hoof, and they still don't really know, but they think it's because there's actually no insulin receptors in the in the lamellae, um, but there's um, I think is it I, IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1 receptors in the, in the hoof and they think that it's getting in that way and causing the damage. But there's a couple of studies that were done at, at the University of Queensland where they took, um, first of all, ponies and then they did it with standard bred horses where they infused them with very, very high levels of insulin and kept the glucose, blood glucose levels the same by continually infusing glucose as well. And within, I think, 48 to 72 hours, they'd cause laminitis in every horse. So we know that insulin is doing this. Um, we just don't know exactly the mechanism.